20 years, that's a significant lifespan for any band. Um, and yet, interesting, listening to this record, it doesn't seem, it doesn't sound like a record that's long in the tooth, that's uh, a, of a band that's tired of what it's doing. I always say that one of the hardest things, 50% of, of surviving in the music business is just keeping your band together. Um, ben, Very good point. Wh what's yeah. it been like living and breathing Billy, Billy Talent since the, since the beginning? Does it feel like 20 years? It does not feel like 20 years. Uh, you know, we've been Billy Talent for 12 of those 20. Uh, but the first, you know, eight years or so was us really cutting our teeth in the city, you know, like playing from local halls to Masonic temples to uh, basement parties to just anywhere that they had electricity, like to flatbed trucks in Acton. You know what I mean? Like we would play any single place. Worth the drive uh, to Acton. Well, it was that day. Yes. Uh, but uh, no, it was. Uh, it's just been one of those things that the only constant thing that's ever remained between... Uh, the four of us throughout our lives has always been the band, you know, mm. like jobs have come and gone, uh, girls have come and gone, opportunities have come and gone, and this has been the only thing that, uh, without even thinking, this is just what, this is part of us, this is who we are. You regrets, know, other people do it, we just, this is us. Regrets yeah. you've had a few, but too few to mention. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Aaron, Aaron, I mean, you've got this remarkable story I want to talk about in a minute, but but tell me, give, give me a sense of how you think Billy Talent has maintained, sustained, built on this freshness and energy that we hear on this record, Dead Silence? I think it has a lot to do with friendship. Um, you know, the four of us have just been really good friends for 20, more than 20 years, you know, starting this band in high school and you hear all these stories about, you know, the talent show and kids meeting and starting a band and that's where we've taken this, to be able to take this to where we are now is just incredible. So it's like you say, we're just sustaining things and trying to keep things going and it's fun Ian, you've called these guys your brothers um there's obviously an implicit uh, sense of of togetherness and, and closeness when you say that mm -hmm. siblings uh, brothers also fight <laughs> brothers can look at each other and say horrible things with just a stare uh, how do you guys get get through those moments we we've, we've gone through those days and i think those days are, are kind of behind us now as we've turned into men over the years and um that's still it's still going to happen every now and then, but uh, we've we've definitely learned what buttons not to press anymore, and uh, <laughs> and it's working. <laughs> uh, what, how did you learn that? What did you what, what what was the process of getting through those times? Well, just you know, like everyone fights. If we we're gonna be we we're gonna be on the road somewhere in the middle of uh, a foreign country, and you know, it could be on a tour bus or in a van or at the venue, or you know, the fights are just going to happen. And uh, we we were lucky to get past them and and move on from them. You know I mean? Tell me how you've musically sustained what you do, because th there's almost an interesting paradox with, with Billy Talent. On the one hand, there's this punk rock ethic and, and the punk roots that you come from. On the other hand, there's this mainstream rock uh, um, element to the band that isn't necessarily, doesn't speak to nonconformity and, and attack, you know, ad addressing social responsibility. Mainstream rock, we think of making hits and making money, and, and, and it's more about the business. Um, Aaron, how has it been walking the line between those two sides of Billy Talent, do you think? Well, you know, we to be able to take something to this level um, is really incredible. You know, you started off as a garage band, and you always want to get to the point where you can be playing in a stadium in front of thousands of people. And for us to be able to do that is a dream come true every day. So, um, you know, it's it's this mainstream rock thing you're talking about. It's a business. It's a it's an animal, and we're, we're constantly learning every day how to... Uh, how to just be involved in this world of music and making a living out of it. It's, it's not easy. You, your lyrics talk about uh, sometimes about corporate growth, about, about social responsibility, about attacking uh, oligopolies. Uh, how do you um, do the gut check to know that you haven't crossed the line when it comes to the mainstream rock part, Ben? Ian and I write <clears throat> all the lyrics, and when we're, when we're, whenever we're working on a topic or discussing something, like Viking Death March, when we were working on Viking... You know, it would be the type of things that we would just be conversing about. You know, like, God, like the Occupy movement's happening, the G20 is happening in the city, it's like militant state and, the, uh, you know, everything happening around the world with all these uprising and people taking over. And, you know, it was a very powerful uh, little period there, and we were part of it. So we just kind of looked at how that affects us as, you know, people living in Toronto in, in, in this day and age. And seeing that, uh, you know, it's it's a call to arms in a lot of ways and realizing that if you do believe in something and if you do want something, you can change it. And there's a lot of like-minded individuals that are out there. You just have to 
present a platform. You know, we we always say, like lyrically, when we're discussing things, it's the type of stuff that you discuss with your friends at the pub having a pint. You know, mm-hmm. you just kind of you. Be- is it? But is it possible to maintain the punk ideals with massive mainstream success? I think so. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The Clash did it well, and bands like Rage Against the Machine did it exceptionally. Yeah. Well, yeah. the Clash broke up. <laughs> That's true. And so did like Rage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they, they had some issues with it, but that was for a number of other reasons too. Uh, to explore that for me, Ian. Why it's why it's why why you don't think that's uh, an issue? I think it, it's because the four of us have known each other for so long. Our ide- a lot of our ideals and, and core fundamental beliefs haven't really changed over the years. Like we 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 are still the same people that we grew up. with as in high school or when we played down on Queen Street like 15 years ago. And uh, all those beliefs really haven't changed. And I don't think they will because we were, we were basically signed and, and uh, exposed to the mainstream once we had already established our identities as men. And uh, we were pretty late. We were, we were like 27 years old. So I don't think you could change a person by that age. You, you're signed to a major label. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about challenges you've faced being signed to a major label and wanting to maintain the ethos that you just talked about? Um, we, we really haven't had any, I'm going to be honest here, they haven't really stepped in and, and told us to change anything ever. Have you? Re- can you recall a situation? No. Maybe in America. Yeah. And that's why we're no longer on a major in America. <laughs> you, hear, you hear all these stories, though, but like in books and in media, that you know the label comes in and they tell you to change everything. And, and I believe them. Like that, that does happen with a lot of pop artists. But I think... Uh, um, the people that were working with us at the time really understood what we were about, and they didn't really try to change us. Maybe in America, like a couple people at the the label we were on in America did at the time, but they didn't they didn't push too far, if you know what I mean. They've never sound said more like Green Day. <laughs> yeah, yeah well. just try to sound like more like Green Day. Like, we're well, this, but we're not. Look yeah, how Green successful Day. Green Day have been. Yeah, yes, yeah, please sound great. like them. Yeah, yeah, but that's They've not never said dudes, dress a certain way or do this or or or. What about no, what no, about no, the last no, record no, no. and 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 bringing bringing in a big American producer? Yes, uh, when Ian had done the the previous record with Gavin Brown, a hometown guy, and yeah. and, and this very much from the outside at least looked like the American label saying this is what we need you no, to do. No, I mean for, no, absolutely not. It was uh, we kind of put together a wish list of people that we wanted to work with, and it was either Butch Vigor. Uh, Brandon O'Brien just because they're Butch Vig and Brandon O'Brien their track records of what they've done and worked right. on going back to bands like you know from Pearl Jam to Rage Against the Machine to Soundgarden to you know uh, list goes on and Bruce Springsteen to you know um, so when we actually got the opportunity we were like okay this sounds like a great thing to do yeah, yeah, they, they basically it. gave us a wish list. But I will say this, though. Th- there was an air of uncomfortability ab- about them wanting to trust the guitar player to produce the record. You know what I mean? Like, right. So they did. They were the ones that did say, hey, what about an A-level American producer? And at that mm. time, we were like, well, if we can work with one of these guys, like Butch Fig or Brendan O'Brien, then, uh, then we'll totally go for it. And, Interestingly, yeah. you produced this record, Ian. Mm. Again, it's back to... And, and this has been talked about as a return to form for Billy Talent. Not just great reviews, but this is the Billy Talent we liked after a misstep on the last record. Mm-hmm. That's been what some, some folks have said in, in terms of critically. What do you make of that? I think it, uh, you know, partly that's partly true. I think we're all really proud of that last record, but uh, um, I know our fans were uh, definitely, our hardcore fans were definitely thrown for a loop a little because they ha- they've gotten used to the sound of the first and second record. And that's something that basically Gavin really established on the first record and then and Gavin and myself continued with on the second record. So to all of a sudden just change that for the third record, I, it's totally understandable why people would not, will not get it as much that we're hardcore fans, but at the same time, it also opened up uh, us up to a whole bunch of new fans. So, is it true, Ben, that that the rest of the band members asked the American label to make sure that Ian doesn't uh, produce the record? What? <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 But you gathered around with protest songs, yeah, yeah, saying, yeah, yeah, "Please, yeah, yeah. protest songs, yeah. <laughs> please no. make sure that Ian doesn't try and produce." No, this we were we were so excited on this record. To, I mean, when the the time <laughs> happened to no, no, no. But you looked at me so sadly. I was obviously kidding. Yeah, I was trying to see if I <laughs> got the question wrong. <laughs> uh, no, but when we worked on this record, when the the time came, and working with Brennan was great, and it was an interesting experience. We all learned a lot, uh, both positive and negative. And uh, when it was this time, you know, we kind of had a brief conversation of like, well, who's, what are we going to do on this record? And all the guys in the band were like, 
Ian, you yeah. you have to do it. Like you've this no more messing around. Let's uh, let's let's do it all ourselves. Even myself. <laughs> yeah. One yeah. of the things we don't. <laughs> Ian voted for I was, himself. I'm voting for myself. <laughs> right, right. As you should. Ian. Yeah. One of the things that we don't always know in Canada um, with our with our own artists, especially, is how well you're doing in other parts of the world. And um, <laughs> I remember being in in the Warner offices in in Germany in, about four years ago in Hamburg. And I Great walk place. in, and I walk in, and there's just Billy talent posters everywhere in the Warner offices. And I, I kind of thought, oh, they must be, you know, somebody's a big fan of Billy. And I asked them about it, and they were like, yeah, well, oh yeah, they're Canadian. They're 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 one of the biggest bands in Germany. I mean, you are massive in Germany, and this is something that some of the folks might might not know listening across North America. Your video for Viking Death March was filmed at your performance at the Rock Am Ring Festival, in in front of a hundred thousand screaming Germans. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aaron, tell me about the German success of Billy Talent. That just started from a lot of legwork in in the beginning. We had we toured there so much. We went back. It was kind of like the working on Queen Street and coming back and coming back and coming back. And we just always started coming back to, to Germany. So playing there so many times and starting at a fifty seater club, no one could get into it. To a three hundred seater club, to a thousand seater club, you know, we we got taken out by one of the biggest bands in Germany, a band called the Beatsteaks. And uh, we opened for them on one of their tours, and that really propelled us um, there as well. And people in Germany, rock music is like pop music there. Mm-hmm. Like they, they listen to hard rock music as their popular music. So our band just really did well there. That's part of it. Have you have you figured out what the ingredient is that makes you like catnip to Germans? <laughs> <laughs> I I really can't figure it out myself. Um, it's it's what Aaron said. It's, it is a lot of legwork. We d- we definitely went there, and it was a support from the label there. They were they were gung ho from the second they got the demos. They were totally gung ho, and, and they they worked us hard. And we went over there and played like the fifty seaters and then the hundred seaters, like you said. Ben, there's a sense that in Canada, um, you know, you're getting your due now. It feels like to a, even even I mean to a certain extent, you're playing arenas and people notice that. But there's always, there's been this sense with you guys that. You did it the hardworking way, the sort of indie rock way. You built it one step at a time. And in the process of doing that, without some massive hit single that catapulted the band in one uh, swoop to the top, that you don't always get recognized the way you should when uh, when people talk about the biggest bands in Canada, um, especially when <laughs> you're one of the biggest bands in Germany. Do, <laughs> do, 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 you, do you guys talk about that? Do you uh, ever lament that, or is that I an don't issue think for so. you? I mean, I think we have a way of operating that we've always operated. And I guess uh, through some kind of weird uh, way, like all of our favorite bands growing up were bands that were never really, like uh, my favorite bands, like a Jane's Addiction, you know, or a Faith No More, uh, and bands that never really connected with the mainstream audience, but the people that liked them really liked them, and the people that didn't like them really didn't like them, Mm. you know? And for us, we've always just tried to maintain a sense of putting on the best shows possible, trying to be the best people that you can possibly be, and, 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 putting good energy out there, you know? And um, I think that sometimes doesn't always pay off in ways that people think, but, you know, over the long the long run, you know, we've seen a lot of bands come and go and a lot of uh, um, different scenes kind of come and go, and we've just kind of kept trucking along, still sticking you to our mantra. You need to steal something you know? or walk through an airport naked Yeah, well, we got to step it up, you know? <laughs> just, yeah, we got to walk through an airport naked. That'll go over well. With a, with a pet monkey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, well. Stolen pet monkey. That's a, a, yeah. a Biebs reference from last week. But um, t- and, and tell me about the U.S. market, because um, um, y- you're almost following in the tradition of, of the hip or some of the, some great Canadian bands, although you are doing well in, in the international markets, that, that the States has been a tougher one to crack for you guys, as big as you are up here, right, Ian? Yeah, it has been. Um, we, we do pretty well down there. I mean, we play clubs, and, and people show up, and... And uh, t- we can pretty much do the whole country. Maybe not middle America so much, but definitely the border towns. And but uh, it's been a tough nut to crack. Yeah. Well, it's the, the, your success is always. Um, well, I, the, a couple of friends of mine and I uh, call you the good guys. It's like we oh, you really nice. are hardworking guys who who've always made great music, and it's and it's really fun to see you get the success that you deserve. Then there's this this difficult story that happened right before this last record was completed. And, and, and Aaron, if, if it's cool with you, I want to get to this story before we hear you guys play a song. So so if I've got this right, in 2006, you revealed that uh, that you're battling multiple scler- sclerosis, which is a very difficult disease for anyone to live with, let alone a, a hyperdrummer like yourself. And, and then 
uh, just last year when you guys were writing this re record, you informed the band that you had to undergo open heart surgery. So first of all, what exactly happened and, and, and how is your health now? My health is great now. Um, I, I knew about it about six years ago. And they said, you know, maybe when you're in your 50s or 60s, you'll have to have it replaced. And as I started becoming more physical and more, um, I just did a lot more biking and stuff. And, and they just said to me, okay, your heart is growing and you need to have this valve replaced as soon as possible. So, and this all happened, like the day I got home from recording drums was my, um, my second opinion. And he said, yeah, let's get you in as soon as possible. And if you watch the Viking Death March uh, video, that was the f four months after <laughs> my heart surgery was the playing in front of 100,000 screaming Germans, as you say. So it's I crazy. Kept turning back I to make sure he's still there. They were. I kept turning back to make sure he was still Tell me still about there, little buddy. <laughs> tell, tell me about, uh, um, I read somewhere that you knew that this was an operation that you'd have to have for a while, but you hadn't told the boys about it. Is that true? No, well, I had a conversation with Ben about it right before we went into the studio, and it was like, do I talk about this because I have to go and make this record. I have to play drums. Do I need to tell the guys about this? And, you know, I just thought I have a second opinion coming up. I'm just going to focus on playing drums, get this done, and then figure out what this next doctor says. So, And it was really strange for me to to be thinking that while I was playing drums for this record too mm. like it, i guess anyone would have to really wrap their head around that one but um but i did it were you scared i was up until the day before i was really scared the but then day I before did, the surgery yeah i just had this moment of um calmness about 12 hours before where i was like it's like getting onto an airplane you can't really be afraid every time you get onto a plane mm. you know so everyone I, I even use this analogy that i'll be I'll be doing interviews and talking about this in you know a year from now. So let's just be calm and carry on. And how so. did the, how did the boys react when you when you told them? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> he didn't tell Mo John and me. He only told Ben. Is that right? So, yeah. So right. The, right, right when we finished drums, we got home to Toronto, and and then he told me, and I was just like, dude, I wish you told me this before we went in the studio because <laughs> as he's drumming and doing his takes. You know, me behind the producer's desk with the engineer Eric Ratz, we're both, you know, play harder, man. Give you can you can you can hit them harder. You can <laughs> come on, this is gonna be the best take ever. And little did I know that, you know, yeah. this this thing really you know, serious thing was happening to him and I didn't know. So I just feel like sometimes, my goodness, I could have done some serious damage to the man. And uh, yeah, but then he told me after. Ben, you didn't want to say anything? Mm -hmm. It wasn't up to me. I mean, it, for for the the way we ended our conversation, it wasn't like we were meeting like cloak and dagger in the back <laughs> room right. either. It was like over no, a beer. parking and, lot, yeah, somewhere yeah. We're like having you. a beer, and he's like, "Yeah, I think I gotta go get this heart thing done." I'm like, "Well, what?" He's like, "Yeah." And, my second opinion's when we get back, so I'm just gonna go get the second opinion. I said, all right, well, wait till the second opinion, because really there's nothing to talk about until you get something, especially when you're dealing with something that serious. Mm -hmm. Wait till, because one doctor's be like, you're fine. And the next doctor's gonna be like, you need this right now. Get the defibrillator, you know? So he's, uh, he's fine. It worked out. Yeah, looked pretty good. He looks That's great. Has it, does it change your, your Handsome what you man. need to do on, the, on, on tour? Do you, do you have mm -hmm. you? Well, changed your practices in terms of uh, what you do out there? No. Um, I, anyone who's toured extensively for 10 years knows it's not easy for anyone. So I think just being healthy and, and uh, being smart, and I just try to be healthy. I, I've never ran on treadmills before in my entire life, and over the past year I'm going to the gym and running on treadmills. So it's it's actually a positive thing, and uh, that's, the, that's the only way you can look at it. Good for you. I uh, before it's 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 great to hear that story and 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 to have you guys here. Before I let you uh, play a song, and we're very grateful that you're playing in Studio Q. Um, not only has Aaron rebounded, but the four of you have produced this really strong record that uh, has done really well for you. And you're now nominated for in a couple of weeks as the Junos are happening in in Regina. You're Woo. nominated for three Junos: yeah. Single of the Year, Group of the Year, Rock Album of the Year. What do those nominations mean to you at this stage of your career, Ben? I as, think a, as a grizzly actually, veteran. Yeah, which is weird with gray in my beard. Uh, I think for the first time, and not to negate the fact of how lucky and appreciative, but I think it means a lot more as we're getting older, you know, because the climate has changed so dramatically and the, the landscape is always constantly with every step is a different, you know, different set of problems or new doors opening, you know. So 
I think for us to, you know, be on 20 years as a band together and 10 years as this band, and, you know, I think it's it's a really nice tip of the cap to have people appreciate still what we're doing, you know? Because it's really easy to make How yourself... How badly do you want to win? I, I don't really care about winning, you know? I, everyone likes to win. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to walk away with all three. But, uh, you know, who, who, who knows what happens? Carly Rae's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't, I don't think, think she's up for rock album of the year. No, so. but I think she's Viking Death rock. March versus Call Me <laughs> Maybe of the year, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. I think well, right, we're, single yeah, of the year. I'm pretty yeah. sure she's gonna win it. <laughs> that will be the biggest uh, undertaking <laughs> ever. <laughs> uh, you're gonna play a song for us. What are you guys gonna play for us? Ian? Uh, we're gonna play Stand Up and Run. It's our new single. Uh, I, my favorite song on the record. I, I'm so appreciative that you're here. Finally, Thank you for having us. Why yes, have you been shutting the show? Other. Yeah, shutting the show. You have, uh, you know, it's called email. <laughs> you've been boycotting. 